Today the webinar is about the critical sample handling processes for preclinical and clinical studies. We will go through the EMA and FDA guidance in regards to the requirements for the laboratory to follow, also through the challenge that the laboratory will have to address, and that will be done through some uh, case studies. Uh, we'll also discuss about the importance of documentation, and we'll conclude with some key takeaways. In regards to EMA and FDA guidance, I'm referring to the EMA guideline on biomedical method validation, which was released in July 2011, and the FDA guidance for the industry biomedical method validation, which was released in May 2018. The FDA 2018 guidance mentioned that the method development has to determine the chemical stabilities of the analyte in a given matrix including the effects of the sample collection, sample handling, and sample storage. So if you take, by example, a method in plasma, you'll have to check from the old blood uh, collection through the centrifugation of the tubes and then the storage of the harvested plasma. The EMA 2011 uh, mentioned that the method validation has to demonstrate the reliability of particular uh, method in a specific biological matrix. And this matrix can be anything such as uh, blood, serum, plasma, urine, etc. And in order to do so, you have to evaluate the stability uh, to ensure that every step taken during the sample preparation and sample analysis, as well as the storage condition, uh, do not have any impact on the concentration of the analyte. The FDA 2018 uh, stipulate that you have to establish a detailed written procedure which would identify the procedure that control critical parameters from the time of collection of the samples to the time of the analysis. And this is on, in order to minimize the effect on the measurement of the analyte in the matrix. Therefore, you have to consider the environmental of your collection tubes and transfer tubes, the matrix that you have to um, collect, and the procedural variables such as the centrifugation speed. The FDA 2018 guidance um, indicates that a validation of an analytical method has to answer some key questions. So you have to answer how do the sample collection, handling, and storage affect the reliability of the data from the biological method, uh, what steps need to be followed while collecting samples, do the samples need to be frozen during shipping, what temperatures are required to store, to store the samples, and how long can the sample be stored. The EMA 2011 indicates that a stability should, ensure, should be ensured for every step of the analytical method in the analytical method, and the analytical condition should be similar to those used for the actual sam study samples. Therefore, you have to think about the sample matrix, but also the anticoagulant, the container ma materials, and the storage conditions. The Global Bioanalysis Consortium, which is an organization including um, a representative of scientific association, has uh, published in 2016 their sample management recommendations and they agreed that the sample procedure should be described in a protocol or within a lab manual and should include at least the volume of the sample to be collected, the required anticoagulant, if your sample has to be protected from line because of uh, inst light sensitivity of your analyte, the collection containers, the storage containers, and maybe more. So the challenge for the laboratory, um, in fact, 
the FDA 2018 indicates that if the storage conditions change and the sample analysis occurred outside of the validated storage conditions, then the stability should be reestablished under these new conditions. But this is not always possible due to lack of resources or timelines. And therefore, depending on the type of study you're running, you may have two different options. First, in the bioequivalence study, the sample will not be reported at all. Whereas in the development of a new monocular entity, uh, the sample results will, will be flagged, but often the concentration will still be presented. The alignment of the sample collection with the method validation is easier said than done. So laboratory input is not always obtained prior to sample collection. Therefore, you may have to uh, validate your method you, under the conditions that the samples were already collected at. Um, the plasma harvesting may also require to be performed at 4 degrees Celsius, whereas your clinical site may not have refrigerated centrifuge at hand. Regarding the long-term stability, you may have tested at minus 20, and then you're shipping on dry ice, which is typically um, assumed as minus 80. Right now, there are some discussion about uh, having the long-term stability at minus 20 being enough uh, to uh, prove the stability at minus 80. Here are some challenges, uh, and we'll go through some case studies with small molecules in plasma. So first, the anticoagulant. While developing a bionetical method, uh, you have to prioritize for commercially available vagutainers uh, at Alta Sciences were commonly using the uh, K2EDTA and the heparin as they are the easiest one to use in the clinical or test at the clinical site and test facility. Uh, whereas you may have to change and use less frequently used uh, anticoagulant such as the NAFCO. Uh, in fact, let's say uh, let's take the example of the acetyl salicylic acid, which will be uh, will degrade in presence of esterases, and therefore you'll need the NAFCO in order to inhibit this es these esterases and then um, uh, keep the acetyl salicylic acid uh, stable. Then the old blood stability. The case study here is Presgrel. So Presgrel metabolite contains a tile moiety uh, rapidly oxidized in blood, which would uh, lead to its instability in whole blood. Therefore, you have to add a preservative directly after the blood draw to preserve this metabolite and ensure its appropriate quantitation. And here is the uh, structure of the uh, derivatized metabolite that obtained during, uh, after the addition of the preservative. The hemolysis also have an impact on your method and therefore, even though you're validating your assay uh, up to a certain level of uh, hemolysis, uh, typically used in uh, the community will be two or five percent, you may have to modify your analytical technique to ensure that this level of hemolysis is also validated uh, with the method. Um, also, you may have to change your sample collection conditions just because due to the hemolysis, you will observe, observe analytic, analytic insta instability. And here is the case of morphine, which is a small molecule, and the, analy the analytical technique that was significantly affected by the hemolysis for this compound uh, as the concentrations were 50% lower in hemolyzed samples. And it was observed that the hemolysis in conjunction with the extraction procedure can result in the oxidative degradation of the phenolic drug products such as morphine. And as a result, we had to adjust the extraction and completely revalidate the assay. Before the extraction, it is really important to verify 
for the presence of hemolysis as it may have an impact on the reliability of your data. Uh, addition of a preservative, uh, there are unstable analytes, often uh, small molecules, and adding a preservative at the clinical or the preclinical site may be required. Uh, this preservative could be uh, acidic solution, protease inhibitor, dervatization agent. And in terms of that, the important point will be to determine the preservative to blood or plasma ratio that will be required to preserve the molecule and also the time frame that you have to add the preservative. So the stability of the analyte without preservative. Here is a, ca a case study of the omega-3. Uh, different affinities for in vivo binding resulting in various bound entities for both APA and DHA would lead to the presence of triglycerides and phospholipids in the sample. Therefore, following uh, enzymatic activity, degradation will be observed, uh, leading to a higher concentration of APA and DHA. Uh, as you can see below, the table um, in the table, uh, using only K2 EDTA as anticoagulant without any preservative, uh, you'll observe a deviation about 40% higher than compared to a fresh sample. And therefore, you have to use anticoagulants such as NAFCO in addition to the preservative addition, which is the uh, a solution, an acidic solution here. And as you can see, you also need a precise concentration of the acid, so 0.5%, in order to be within the acceptance criteria, which are plus or minus 15% to control the conversion here. So here are some other case study uh, more for peptides in plasma. There are commercially available products for the preservation of certain compounds. Here is a case study of glucagon, a vacutainer containing protease inhibitor cocktail Becton Dickinson P800 is specifically designed to prevent degradation of glucagon. As you can see in the below table at room TEM, without preservative or even with the addition of apotinin, which is another protease inhibitor, degradation of glucagon is significant, whereas using the BDP800, there is a significant um, decrease in the degradation, so increase in stability of glucagon. Uh, however, in order to get within the acceptance criteria, uh, all the sample handling for glucagon will still have to be done at Fortevacus. There are also challenges related to different matrices. In urine, there are multiple analytes that will experiment non-specific binding to the containers, and this is basically the absorption of your analyte on the surface of the container. Therefore, you will have to add an anti-absorptive agent that will help releasing the analyte from the surface of the container. And again, the important point will be to consider the volume of the anti-absorptive agent that you will add to a certain volume of urine that will be collected and the time that you have to add this ad anti-absorptive agent. For serum collection, you will also have special considerations such as the vacutainers. They are on the market, the vacutainers with and without slot activator. And this is really important to consider as it may impact the ligand binding assay performance. Uh, also, the environment of the vacutainers before and after the blood collection and the centrifugation temperature must be at room temp in order to allow the uh, serum to clot, the sample to clot. And Clock and all in 2009, uh, 2009 has published that the, um, the samples need to be allowed to clot for at least 30 minutes and not more than 60 minutes before the centrifugation. And this is due to the fact that if allowed to clot for less than 30 minutes, the samples will retain cellular elements and other 
contaminants that will impact uh, future analysis. And also, if the samples are allowed to clot for more than 60 minutes, then the leases of the cells in the clot will start to be observed and it will release uh, cellular components that are not usually found in the serum samples. You also, you may also have specific uh, consideration uh, when it comes to saliva. In fact, a small volume to collect may require the specific collection device. Here at Alta Sciences, we did uh, some uh, projects using the uh, salimatrix uh, device here. Uh, again, in saliva, most uh, the saliva itself is mostly aqueous, and therefore, uh, non-specific binding to the containers may also be observed. And the addition of anti-absorptive agent will have to be required, uh, as well as it was for urine, let's say. And therefore, you will still have to determine what is the quantity of anti-absorptive agent you have to add to your aliquot of saliva, and also the time that you have to add it. At Alto Sciences, we're well recognized for our experience with microsampling, and we are working with our sponsors uh, using the volumetric absorptive microsampling uh, methodology, and we are seeing advantages of this methodology for pediatric and preclinical trials, and also for collection at home. Uh, we are we have experience with the Mitra and the Imolink devices uh, in the regulatory uh, regulated environment, and. The first important point to consider while using uh, this type of uh, microsampling is that the subject has to adequately follow the instruction when collecting the samples outside of the clinical space. So therefore, you will require a really detailed procedure or even a video to um, guide them through this uh, collection of the sample. So the importance of the documentation. It is important that you have detailed instruction. In fact, the alignment of the method validation with the sample collection handling and handling procedure is important, along with providing consistent instruction at the clinical site and the test facility. Therefore, the laboratory will have to provide us either a sample processing instructions document or technically contribute to the preclinical protocol or study plan. You may have also as a lab to contribute to the lab manuals of a clinical study. And in case of complex multi-step procedures, uh, like for the addition of a preservative, uh, videos or PowerPoint presentation may be required. The EMA 2011 uh, mentioned that the analytical report should include the sample tracking, meaning that the date of receipt and content, the sample conditions on receipt, the storage location, storage condition. So in the same line of thinking, the FDA 2018 also uh, mentioned that the documentation that they're reporting at the analytical site uh, should contain the following points, and which is the sample tracking also. So the chain of custody needs to be followed, and therefore throughout the lifespan of each sample, you have to record the location, the storage temperature, the time spent in and out of the storage unit, the time during the analysis, the number of time the sample has been thawed. And therefore, we have implemented at Alto Sciences the uh, Laboratory Information Management System, the, the Watson LIMS, the version uh, 7.6, with which allows us to record all this stuff at the same time. You have to take into consideration also the collection location. In fact, in comparison to the CRO clinical site, the hospitals or physician office will have uh, will focus primarily to on the well-being of their
patients and therefore may not pay that much attention to the sample collection condition. And the same, the same way when the samples are collecting are collected at home by a volunteer patient or even home care providers, you may not they may not have access to adequate instrumentation or storage such as uh, the centrifuge or the freezer at minus 80. And you will also have to consider having an appropriate training for all of them. And therefore, the simplest the uh, sample collection procedure will be, the best it will be for the reliability of your data. So the samples can be compromised at any stage prior to the analysis, and therefore any discrepancies or deviation from the provided procedure should be noted and reported to the laboratory. Uh, in fact, the, in, in fact, the study results may be affected uh, by these discrepancies or deviation, and the data considerations are unique to the type of study. And therefore, if you have a preclinical, a first in human study, a bioequivalent, uh, phase three or therapeutic drug monitoring trial, uh, these discrepancies may have different impact on your study results. In conclusion, uh, the industry community uh, and the regulatory agencies agree on the importance of maintaining the sample integrity from collection to analysis. The method validation or and biological method must be aligned with the sample handling conditions. And therefore, uh, it is important to investigate the impact of any deviation. And to do so, you need to have the clinical and preclinical sites to follow the instructions and document the collection and the processing of the samples, and the chain of custody needs to be well documented. So thank you all for your attention. Again, my name is Annick Bergeron. I'm the Supervisor Compliance and Scientific Review at Atlas Sciences, and here is my address if you want uh, to contact me.